In this video, we're going to talk about the principles of spring remoting. We will demonstrate this with some examples as well in a couple of future videos. So first of all, what is remoting? Well, if we think about the evolution of computing from mainframe to client server to web to mobile device, around the 1990s, software stopped being an island and started getting integrated, which is a lot of the purpose of this class in this playlist the concept of integrating software with other software. So in the mid late 90s, uh, there was a concept where you could have a distributed program, a program that runs on multiple computers. There's quite a bit of power in that. But what would be really nice is if you could program without really knowing where the rest of the program lives. In other words, if you could talk natively from one module to another without realizing that you're actually talking over a network. So there were several technologies that came out around the time. CORBA, or the Common Object Request Broker Architecture, allows you to have a program that's not only distributed across computers, but also across languages. So you could have a Java program talk to a C++ program, or a C++ program talk to Perl, so on and so forth. There, it is a bit tricky, though, because you have to bridge the differences between the languages, and in some cases that means you have to take the lowest common denominator. Additionally, there was quite a bit of configuration required to talk from one language to another. So there were a couple of other alternatives that were a bit simpler but had some limitations. COM and DCOM is a Microsoft implementation that worked very well speaking from one Microsoft language to another. RMI, or Remote Method Invocation, is a way you can speak from one Java program to another Java program. A lot of times you'd have one Java program on a laptop or a PC and another one running on a server. But the, while it was very simple to implement, uh, it was limited to Java to Java. So then they came out with RMI IIOP or RMI over IIOP, which opened this up and let you speak to uh, other kinds of languages outside of Java. But nonetheless, still had some limitations. So around the early 2000s, the concept of web services came out, and I did a video on creating web services with annotations and Eclipse. And the idea is a web service is very similar to its predecessors, CORBA, COM, DCOM, RMI, but XML-based and easy to integrate across the web, easy to integrate one piece of software to another, regardless of what the software is written in. Now we have something called Spring Remoting, which continues our journey of using Spring essentially as a programming language or a way to integrate programs together. So with Spring Remoting, we get a lot of these benefits of remote programming where we can program a distributed piece of software, but it all looks local as we're programming it. Uh, but we also get a bit of ease of configuration as well, especially if we're already using Spring. So a few definitions that will help us out here. Remoting call class in a different JVM, if we're talking about Java, many times an entirely different computer. But when we're programming it, it looks like it's a class that's right on our own computer. So uh, make it easy to program a distributed program. OK, a proxy design pattern. So this is another design pattern that you can add to your arsenal. In a proxy design pattern, you're calling a method and you're getting a response from that method as if you called the method. But actually, there's a different class called a proxy class that intercepts that method call and does something else. So we use that in remoting because we're going to be calling methods local on our, say, on our PC. But then a proxy is going to take that method. It's going to do what we call marshalling and unmarshalling. In other words, it's going to decompose that method call into bytes send that across the network to a server. Uh, and then we're going to get a response back from that server. The proxy is going to marshal that uh, response back together and send it back to us. We won't realize all of that work has happened behind the scenes, but it has. The component on the client side that does this work is called a stub. The component on the server side that handles the call is called a skeleton. Uh, so to make this work on the server, we need to edit our application context XML, our Spring configuration file, and add an HTTP service exporter, define a service and a service interface. 
then we need to define a web servlet URL in WebXML. We'll look at that in the next video where we're actually going to create this. On the client side, we need to use Spring and we need to set up a remoting bean. We need to tell it where it's going to reach this server. In other words, what URL. Uh, we need to say what interface is used on the server. And it's the same interface we're going to use on the client. So we need to have the interface and any DTOs that are used in that interface's method signatures locally on our client. But it's important. We only need the interface, we don't need the implementation of that interface. In other words, if I take a look at a project we've been writing this semester, uh, we've been writing a project, let me just jump out here just for a moment. We've been writing a project called Plant Service, or a project called Plant Places with a class called Plant Service. Plant Service is a, essentially a microservice that's used to add plants, catch plants, search for plants, so on and so forth. And in this class, we see a lot of code. This code is only going to exist on the server side, okay? While we were writing this service, we also wrote an interface that discusses each of the methods that this service has, that the service implements. This interface lives on the server. It will also live on the client, okay? So the client will have the interface but it will not have the implementation class. Instead, we're going to use remoting to marry those two together. This is easiest to show through an animation, so let me do that. So what we see is on the left side is our client application, our swing-based application. We have a JFrame over here. JFrame is going to be calling methods on that iPlant service interface that we just looked at. But again, we only see methods, not implementation. Now, what's going to happen is it's going to reach across the network and go to the actual implementation called plant service, which again is a microservice, essentially. That's going to reach into our plant data access object. That's going to reach into our database. And it's going to return whatever matching plants match that search criteria all the way back to our JFrame. So as we are programming it, it's going to look like this diagram that I have here. but let me show you what's actually going to happen with that proxy design pattern and our stub and our skeleton. When our JFrame calls this interface, what actually happens in the background is it's going to invoke this proxy class, or in other words, this stub class, which implements the interface. But what it's doing then is it's taking that method call and it's moving that method call across the network to the server side. On the server side, it looks like it's calling plant service, which it eventually will, but in reality, it's calling a skeleton that knows how to receive this network call. And when it receives that network call, it's going to message that over to the plant service implementation class, which makes these further calls down to the database and then returns the data back to our, uh, back to our client and then to our JFrame, which is going to show that data. So that's an overview of how remoting works. In the next video, we're going to see how we need to set up the server side. And in the video after that, we're going to see what changes we need to make on the client side to be able to make this uh, proxy call over to the server. I look forward to seeing you then. Thank you.